All right, so we are starting chapter six today. And uh, chapter six is all about energy. Um, we have been dealing with matter and how stuff is made up for a while. Um, and we are now looking at energy. Um, and energy is the ability to do work. If you have some form of energy, you can do something with it. So mechanical energy is what happens in, in machinery and vehicles and things of that nature. Uh, chemical energy, stuff that is in uh, like, like food that you eat has chemical energy. Energy allows something to be done. So it is the ability to do work. Um, we measure the amount of energy that something has and the amount of work that it can do. And so not all forms of energy are always being used. There are things called potential energy where no work is being done right now, but it could be done if you wanted to use the energy for that. Um, and we, we always talk about the quantity of work that energy can perform. And we measure that in a joule, J-O-U-L-E, sounds like the thing on a ring, but not spelled that way. This is named after a, uh, a famous physicist who, who discovered lots of the fundamental um, properties of, of energy and various kinds of energy. So uh, physicists later named the unit of energy after him and his honor. So it's the joule. Uh, and a joule is always positive. You can't have negative joules. You can have negative meters if you're doing displacement, and you can have, you know, negative other sorts of measurements. But the joule is a scalar quantity. Um, it is. It has. It does not have direction. Um, it is always positive. You can't have negative work. Um, that would be. Yeah. Can't imagine a situation where you have negative work. So. The joule is always positive. One joule is the energy needed to apply a force of one newton for one meter. So a joule is one newton meter. And so we already talked about newtons as a unit of force, right? You can push on something with the force of one newton. And then if you were pushing on that thing with the force of one newton, and you got that thing to move one meter, while you are pushing on it with one newton, you will have done one joule of work, right? So just as an example, I don't know how hard to push to make a newton. It's, a, it's, it's not all that hard, but I'm gonna pretend that I'm pushing through with the force of one newton. I'm gonna accelerate my stand here over the course of the meter. If I pushed with one newton of uniform force to accelerate my stand for the, for the distance of one meter, that's a joule of work, okay? So a joule is one, Newton meter. And again, there's different kinds of energy, and so um, not all kinds of energy will make a make something move, um, but it's that unit of force that we mess with, the joule, that's defined as a newton meter. Okay, here's a sample problem. How much energy is needed to accelerate a mass of two kilograms at a rate of two meters per second squared? For three meters. So here's my knowns. I have two kilograms, two meters per second squared is my acceleration, and my distance is for three meters. So first I need to calculate the force. Force is mass times acceleration. So force is mass, which is two kilograms, times acceleration, which is two meters per second squared. 2 times 2, my force is 4 newtons. So my force is pushing with 4 newtons. And I am able to accelerate an object applying that force for a distance of 3 meters. So now a joule is a newton meter. So I, I know my newtons. It's 4 newtons. And my meters are 3 meters. So 4 newtons for 3 meters is 12. It takes 12 joules of energy to push on something with a force of 4 newtons and get it to accelerate over the distance of 3 meters. Okay? So a joule, again, is a newton meter. It would take 12 of those joules. Now, we don't, we don't use joules in the English system. Um, if you're into cars and engines, You've never heard some of an engine with a certain amount of joule 
force or torque or something like that. But the English equivalent of this is a foot pound. So if you've ever, if you work on, in, on cars and you've heard of certain like foot pounds of torque, that's the same kind of energy, um, the, the same kind of measurement. This is just the metric version of that sort of thing. Okay. So these are joules. Go ahead and take a moment and write that down. Okay, so energy does work. We measure work in force and distance. Now, there are sometimes forces that are not causing motion right now, but could. And those forces are called potential energies. So um, right now, it's something I can drop safely. This rag on top of my head um, is not moving. Well, unless I move my head. But it's not, a, it's not moving at the moment. But it could move. And, and what motion is, is possible would be the rag to fall from the distance of my head, right? And what causes the rag to fall from the distance of my head to the floor would be gravity. Gravity pulls on that. That's an example of a potential energy. There is energy in the rag, even though at this moment there's no work happening because it's not moving. But there's potential for work to be done because it could have. This is an example of gravitational potential energy, right? A, uh, a piece of candy represents chemical potential energy. The, the energy in the sugars of that piece of candy is not at the moment doing anything, but it can make my daughter very hungry, right? So potential energies are energies that exist, but at, at this moment in time are not doing any work. But the ability to do work is there in the system, okay? The most common form of, of potential energy is gravitational potential energy. Something that has mass, that is suspended up above the Earth, in our case, or if you're up in space, it could be some distance away from the sun. But anything where there's a, a pull of gravity on an object, and the object is removed from that thing pulling on it, there's gravitational potential energy. Gravity can do work on the object, but right now, it's not happening, okay? And to calculate gravitational potential energy, or GPE, you just take the weight of the object, which is its force, right? It's not, we're not talking mass. Mass and weight are different. We covered that last time. Um, you take the weight of an object times its height. How far can it fall? And you get its gravitational potential energy. So the GPE of this rack on my head, I just like having the rack on my head, we're going to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think it's cool. Um, is the weight of the rag, which is not all that much, right? This weighs, this weighs maybe, maybe 200 grams, 250 grams, not very much. But that mass times the acceleration of gravity will give you its weight times its height, approximately two meters right now, um, above the ground. And that is the potential energy to represent the work that gravity might do on the rag if it were to fall off my head. Okay, so GPE, let's do an example problem with that. Mr. Alley is standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon. This is where we used to live. Considering how much potential energy due to gravity he currently possesses, uh, oh, sorry. Considering that's not a well structured sentence. Huh. His mass is 105 kilograms. He's uh, 1,620 meters above the Colorado River. So what is my potential gravitational potential energy? Um, so if I have my mass, and at one point it was 105 kilograms. I'm less than that now, praise the Lord. But anyway, 105 kilograms, and I am um, 1,620 meters above the Colorado River. So you would take my mass, 105 kilograms, multiply it by the acceleration of gravity to get my weight. So I weigh 1,029 newtons. 1,029 newtons. Um, and I am 1,620 meters above the Colorado River. So what's my gravitational potential energy if I were to take a flying leap off of Hermit's Point, which is where we took this picture, and land in the Colorado River? Um, I would be dead. But what kind of gravitational energy would I have released in the course of doing that? 1,629 newtons times 1,620 meters 
is that number very, very large, 1,666,980 joules. But I need to correct for significant digits, three significant digits, uh, three significant digits, so I need three significant digits, so 1,670,000 joules is the gravitational potential energy of my body that high up over the Colorado River. Okay, so that's gravitational potential energy. You guys understand the idea? Force and distance, same thing as a joule. Are you scared of heights? No. I don't like falling from things. I can stand up there and look down at the river, but if I were to, really? but if I were to fall off of that for even just a small distance, I'd really be miserable. So another form of motion of energy is the energy of motion. So gravitational potential energy not doing any work right now, uh, but then when that starts to actually do work, it's usually because something is falling, right? So if you go on a roller coaster, um, and I don't know, on the island are there are there any roller coasters here? The State Fair, wow, that's a sad example of a roller coaster. Oh. I hope you get out to the mainland and go to like Knott's Berry Apartments or Magic Mountain at some point in your life. Disneyland has okay roller coasters. But um, the, uh, if you get on a roller coaster and it cranks you up to the top of the hill, at that instant before the roller coaster starts going, you have gravitational potential energy, the mass of the train and your butt in the train, right? Mass and, a, and an ability to fall. Gravitational potential energy. And then you start to go down the hill and you go, woo, right? Now you have energy of motion. Now you have energy of motion. And that is kinetic energy. Um, when we calculate kinetic energy, it still has to do with mass. Um, and it has, to, but now we're not looking at how far it can fall, we're looking at how fast it's moving. So mass still comes into play. But now it's having to do with how fast is that mass moving to calculate its kinetic energy. So we look at the velocity of an object, not its acceleration. So this is a little bit different, right? Um, we're not looking at its acceleration. We're looking at its velocity. And to calculate kinetic energy, it is one-half times the mass of the object times its velocity squared. One-half times the mass of the object times its velocity squared. So you need the mass and its current velocity. Um, let's do an example problem here. Uh, the M2 Browning machine gun fires 50 caliber rounds that weigh 43 grams. That's a very heavy bullet, okay, 43 grams. And travels at 820 meters per second. It's a very fast round as well. What is the kinetic energy carried by one of those rounds? So 43 grams. We need to be in kilograms, so I've got to convert that. 43 grams is 0 0.043 kilograms. And its velocity is 820 meters per second. So my formula of kinetic energy is one-half times the mass times the velocity squared. One-half times the mass times the velocity squared. Let's square that first for order of operations. And we get this delightful number. And then we take that times kilograms, and we wind up with joules. Um, 144, sorry, 14,456.6 joules. Uh, we only got two significant digits here, so I have to go to two significant digits in my answer, and I wind up with 14,000 joules. Uh, that is a lot of energy. Now, for right now, don't worry about how I took kilograms and multiplied it by meters squared per second squared and got joules. The units do convert properly. I'm not going to make you do that in, uh, in your freshman level physical science class, but when we get to this again in physics, when you're seniors, you'll get to do all those fun conversions for me. For right now, just believe me, it's in joules, okay? So 14,000 joules is the answer. So again, mass times velocity. Um, sorry, one-half mass times velocity squared. Okay? You guys understand that idea? How much energy does a moving object have? Cool. Okay, two more forms of energy. We won't make you do math with these. Thermal energy is the, uh, is the amount of, of heat energy that an object has. And it has to do with its temperature. And interestingly, heat energy is just another form of kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion, and so is thermal energy. 
the more something moves, the more heat it builds up, it generates, right? And you can see that superficially by like rubbing your hands together. If you do it slowly, you can feel it warm a little bit. But if you really rub your hands together, you can feel a lot more heat. And that has to do with friction between two moving objects. Thermal energy is a big picture of friction between moving objects at a very, very, very small level. So uh, the reason that you are a certain temperature and your desk is not is because inside your body, things are moving and things are rubbing against each other. And there's stuff going on. And inside the desk, there's much less stuff going on. Thermal energy is heat energy, and it is proportional to the, the motion inside the material. Okay? And we're usually talking about the motion of atoms. How much are things vibrating in the material? So uh, your, you know, my music stand or your desk feels cool to the touch or cold to the touch because the atoms and the molecules in there are vibrating, but not all that fast. And so there is some heat of friction built up between the vibrating things, and you can perceive that as, as not freezing cold, but cool. But as, you, as things get cooler, as the temperature drops, the reason the temperature drops is because the motion inside that thing is slowing down. And so there comes a point when you slow down the internal activity of a material to the point where there's no more motion. And when there is no more motion, there is no more temperature. And we call that number zero Kelvin, named after a very famous physicist, Lord Kelvin. Um, and I just realized there's a typo here that should not say zero degrees. You don't say degrees with Kelvin. It would just be zero Kelvin. So you can cross out that whole symbol. Um, but Kelvin is the absolute temperature scale. Zero Kelvin is the coldest that something can be. We call that absolute zero. And at zero Kelvin, all motion stops. Um, that is approximately equivalent to negative 273 degrees Celsius. Okay? Uh, the Kelvin scale and the Celsius scale have degrees that are the same size. So adding one Kelvin is the same as adding one degree Celsius as far as the amount of thermal energy that you're talking about. It's just that their zeros are set at different place. Uh, zero Celsius is 273 Kelvin. Zero Kelvin is negative 273 Celsius. So to convert between them is very easy. Okay. So that is the temperature which all things stop. Anything above that has the temperature it has because there's internal motion and that generates thermal energy. Okay. Acoustic energy. The sound of my voice, says McGrath, is a form of acoustic energy. Um, and that has to do, again, with motion. But here we're talking about the motion of particles in the air. I make a noise, and my vocal cords slap together at a certain frequency that you can hear as a sound. And the slapping together of my vocal cords disturbs the air around them. And that disturbance comes out through my mouth and generates a wave in the air between me and your ear. And then your ear gets beat up by the air which is being disturbed by my vocal cords, and your brain goes ooh, 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 as the waves are hitting it, and it, it turns that into sound information, okay? So the moving of the air between me and you is what's making you hear me. Um, and so it's still a form of kinetic energy, but it's an oscillation of matter, and we're gonna get more into waves and things like that later. This is kind of just a cursory overview of the idea. It's the air in between me and you that's shaping me, that lets you hear my voice, okay? So the oscillation of matter, which carries sound energy. The higher the frequency of the oscillation, the higher the pitch. So when I talk down here, my vocal cords are not moving as fast. And so the amount of wave energy hitting your ear is less right now. And you perceive that as a lower pitch. And when I talk up here, <laughs> the reason that you hear me sounding so silly is because there are more oscillations of the waves between my voice and your ear. Okay, so higher pitch, 
there are more shaking of the air, more oscillations, higher frequency, lower pitch, lower oscillations, lower frequency. Okay, and now that has been captured for all time and eternity, which is awesome. Um, so thermal energy um, is again a form of, of motion at the molecular level. Um, this is just an, a, an infrared image, it's kind of cool, of something hot being poured into a cup. It might be coffee, it might be uh, a latte, it might be tea, it might be whatever. Um, but you can see the hot energy, the, the thermal energy in this infrared uh, image of the stuff coming down and going into the cup and the environment around is cooling. So the stuff in here is moving a lot faster than the air around it, okay? Um, there's another infrared image and it just shows parts of this uh, boy holding a basketball probably. And you can see the different places that are moving faster and so have a higher temperature than the air around them. Um, and then this would be uh, another example of thermal energy. The, uh, the factory is producing uh, hot air, which rises through these smokestacks. And that's caused by the internal energy of the air there, okay? Um, if there's very little thermal energy, this is very, very cold. And this wasn't taken where I um, used to live, but it did get cold enough to do this where I used to live, where you can throw boiling water in the air. And um, there's so little thermal energy in the air that all the thermal energy from the boiling water is immediately sucked out of the water once it gets into small droplets. And it goes from boiling water to snow before the stuff hits the ground. That's cold. Um, and I've done that same experiment. It's kind of cool. Um, and again, Thermal energy has to do with the motion of particles. So this was just kind of a cool idea for absolute zero, where something is so cold that there is no internal motion, and that's absolute zero, okay? Uh, another picture for sound energy. So it's a wave, um, and don't worry about why it looks like this and not like this for right now. It's a wave, and the shaking of the air molecules produced by the speaker sets up a wave pattern that then bombards your ear with that wave pattern and you interpret that as sound, okay? So different sounds have different frequencies and amplitudes and waveforms sometimes look pretty cool as you look at them. I think this is our last one. Another form of energy is electrical energy. Um, this has to do with materials that carry a charge, which is a surplus or a, de or a deficit of electrons. So um, we talked briefly already about the atom, we're going to get more into detail with the atom later, but you already know that an atom has a positively charged nucleus with protons and neutrons in it, and has negatively charged electrons orbiting around the outside, we've already covered that much detail. And in a neutral atom, the amount of positiveness, positivity, in the nucleus equals the amount of negativity floating around on the outside, so if it has, in the case of carbon, six protons in the middle, it will also have six electrons in the cloud around it. And the six plus and six minus equals zero, right? And so it's neutral. But if those six carbon uh, protons were not balanced by six electrons, if they were instead uh, looking at eight electrons or 10 electrons, then there would be more negativeness than positiveness. And the, uh, the, atom would be charged, it would have an electrical charge. So electricity or an electrical energy is a, is a surplus or a deficit of electrons versus the number of protons. And so um, those materials that can generate a charge, that can hold a charge, can have electric energy, electrical energy. And you can get electric, uh, electrons to flow along a material and, and uh, you know, if I were an atom, and Angela were an atom, and Sienna were an atom, and Josiah were an atom, if we're four atoms of copper, let's say, in a wire, and the wire comes this way and bends and goes through Josiah, let's say that I have a surplus of electrons. I've got more than I need. I can pass some of my electrons over to Angela, who then can pass them to Sienna and pass them to Josiah. And, and we're handing off electrons to each other. And that's an electrical current, that's electricity, is electrons going from one 
metal, almost always a metal uh, atom to another and just bounce it along as it goes. That's electrical current. So electrical energy is a, an ability to pass electrons around. Because of the way metals are made, metals are almost the only kind of elements that can conduct a charge. And I'm sure you've noticed that. Um, it's hard to get a shock from a wooden object, but you can get a shock from a metal object. Um, and so uh, this usually is metals that are able to conduct or carry or have a charge. You can induce a charge on insulators, but it's, it's a different, different sort. Okay, so electrical energy is another form of energy. So your this next chapter just talks about various kinds of energy, and that energy um, can change forms, but it's never destroyed. And we're going to be uh, messing with that concept throughout this. Time. Any questions? No. Fabulous. All right. We will play with this some more in the next couple.